Hello, I'm Bob the Bookerer and welcome to my channel. And today I just wanted to talk about the 2003 Booker Prize shortlist. So as I've been doing with the shortlists as I've been going through, um, I've been sort of looking at some of the books that ended up in these old shortlists, uh, or previous shortlists, I should say. And it's always quite interesting to see how they all sort of come together. And the 2003 one, I think, is quite noticeable for many reasons, partly because some quite well-established books or quite well-established authors were there, um, but also because this is one where, as we find out, sort of, as we found out a bit later, the winner was essentially chosen a long time before uh, before we got to the, the, the shortlist in some ways. Um, so let's get in and talk a little bit about the shortlist. Another side point before I start with the shortlist here, Interestingly, a book that was long listed here and didn't make the shortlist is Mark Haddon's A Curious uh, Incident, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, which has gone on to just be this real cult classic. And I say cult classic, it, it's beyond a cult classic. It was an incredibly popular book in the UK, at least. Um, a book that explores essentially sort of um, the autism spectrum, um, but through a sort of... Uh, mystery detective novel but with a really compelling character young boy at its heart um it's, it's so interesting because that is a book that i can see in some ways why it wasn't shortlisted um in that sometimes shortlists are kind of given over more to literary novels or whatever even though i think curious incident does a lot of really impressive things um, but it's interesting because that's probably also a book that's stood the test of time, maybe better in some ways than a lot of books that actually went on to be shortlisted. Um, and so, yeah, uh, some other interesting big names like Martin Amis and uh, Jane Curtsy on the list as well, on the long list. This was in the time where long lists were like 20 books as opposed to the 13 that we have now. And so... Honestly, I was looking at potentially reading long lists as part of my project, and I was like, I might do that for a few years. I'm not doing it for 2003. I may eventually, in terms of just slowly catching up, I'm not adding it to the project right now. Anyway, on with the shortlist. First up, we have the winner, Vernon Godlittle by DBC Pierre. And it's um, quite an odd little book, this one. It largely deals with... Um, a young boy who is basically falsely accused of having been involved in um, in a crime that takes place, a school shooting, basically. And uh, he is believed to be part of it because he was good friends with the accused and um, all the, and then because he basically runs away from the police. And in many ways, it fits into that kind of uh, sort of space of something like... Um, a kind of Huckleberry Finn sort of novel. It's kind of a the rebellious outsider kind of character and how he gets through life. And it's told through his style and through his his dialects and all these other things. And in many ways, it kind of starts on that, that track. But then it really goes off on its own weird tangents um, and does its own very strange things. And it sort of eventually becomes a bit of a book that deals with almost the kind of Big Brother style thing not not the kind of Orwell thing but the, the 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 TV show um of kind of how we create a spectacle of criminals and how you know we love to watch them being punished kind of Black Mirror-esque um and so I thought it does some really interesting things with it it's a bit off the wall it's a bit zany as a book um but interestingly as I sort of mentioned at the beginning this book was one of those ones where um, one of the judges basically realised as they were going in to go to dis start discussing the winner that essentially most of the, the, the judges had already made up their mind that this was the winner. Um, they tried arguing for a few other books, but, but alas, uh, this was the one that had been picked essentially by enough of the judges pretty much at the long list stage um, because they just thought that it was so unique and so zany. I don't know if it necessarily holds up as well um, as that would suggest. I think it, it, it's an incredibly idiosyncratic book and I really like that there was a daring winner. But I think it's a book that it speaks to such a specific period of time. Um, I mean, it's still very relevant in many ways, you know, the, the ideas of how we look at people who have committed crimes or we believe to have committed crimes and the way we then punish them. I think this book does this really cleverly. Um... And I think that end part of the book is a lot more enjoyable. But I think there's something so... It it can feel a little bit 
um, too sort of jovial at times, almost like it's sort of trying to be a little edgy. Um, and I don't know if that always necessarily works for this book, um, but still really enjoyable overall. And for me, part of the reason this winner feels slightly odd is because of two other books on the list, one of which is this one here, Monica Ali with Brick Lane. Um, I think this book is phenomenal in many, many ways. It's the story of um, a young woman uh, growing up in a part of East London where she's largely in a fairly, uh, it's sort of a, a Bangladeshi community. And she mostly just sort of operates and lives within this world of that. It's kind of not a closed off community as such, but um, people largely are able to kind of stay within a community of people who look like them um, and, and sort of believe similar things to them. Um, but what I think this book does really well is pokes um, at, pokes at sort of a wider issue around um, sort of, police treatment or kind of wider societal treatment of people who are other in um, in the UK. And I think what it does really cleverly here is we, we watch this, this woman really navigate some really difficult life experiences and sort of in a world that feels incredibly radicalising and hostile and confusing in many ways. She as a woman finds that she sort of has a, an odd role to play because at times she is entrusted with a lot, at times she's seen as being, uh, you know, sort of, she's, she's sort of treated poorly because of it. And she sort of has to navigate this world. I, I find it really quite compelling, particularly as you get deeper into this book, the ways that her life is so trapped and so difficult. And so for me, looking back, this is the book that's really stood the test of time, I think, in many ways. Like, this has been the book that still I see in bookshops sort of touted as a book that you've got to read, a book that really helps you understand various perspectives, a book that really feels like a London novel. Um, and maybe that's what held it back, that it has a sort of very London quality to it, that it's very specifically about Brick Lane. Um, and... Uh, you know, but but I also think it does so, so much with the narrative. I found it really rich and really clever that the inner thoughts of the central character are so well explored, I think, that we really get a sense of the various pressures and complexities in her life. Um, and I just found it really, really compelling for that reason as well. So, yeah, um, I, yeah, this probably would have been my personal pick. Well, this and one of the others. Um, but I, nonetheless, I think it's a very... Um, impactful novel um, and it's really great to see that sort of 20 years on it's a book that I still see in bookshops so it's kind of won the long-term battle as it were in that respect. Next up alphabetically we have Margaret Atwood with Oryx and Crake um, and this is Margaret Atwood. Um, I, I think what I really enjoy about her as an author is her ability to play around and you know approach different forms and pro approach different genres and still bring a very Atwood Atwoodian um, element to it all. Um, and I think this is peak Atwood in that respect of her doing a sort of speculative fiction, um, sort of creating this speculative fiction world. Um, she sort of normally shuns labels like science fiction and fantasy. In her mind, a lot of them uh, are because the worlds that she's creating are not fully fantastical. But in this, this feels somewhat fantastical. But um, it's a sort of world where there are these creatures that are formed out of other creatures. And it has this very Atwood, Atwoodian, I guess, again, um, flair to it. It's sort of funny, it's silly, it's kind of absurd, but there's a wider societal point being made. Um, and I really enjoyed what Atwood does within the pages of this book at sort of just creating this slightly balmy world. Um, this feels like Atwood is having a lot of fun as well, which is really something I admire a lot about her writing, is there's a real joy, I think, often to what she does. Um, it's a really interesting book, I think, in many ways, just the ways that she explores um, these sort of other worlds and how, as soon as you create these other worlds, power vacuums immediately exist and people have to find ways of holding on to power or creating power or, or what have you. And I think this book does some really interesting things with exploring some of those ideas. Next up, we have Damon Galgut with The Good Doctor. Um, and as someone who, I mean, I loved The Promise by Damon Galgut. Um, his other shortlisted book, the name of which will now, of course, completely slip from my brain as soon as I go to talk about it. Give me one second and I will find it. Um, 
he is an author who I just think is incredibly clever in so, so many ways. Um, and his other book, when I find it, there we go. Um, in a Strange Room, there we go. In a Strange Room, I think, is, is, is one of his finest. The Good Doctor, I really greatly enjoyed as well. Um, it is a story of two men who are... Um, working in a, a sort of a fairly remote part um of of, of africa doing um aid work and this is within south africa um but a, a fairly remote part of south africa um doing aid work but primarily working in a hospital um and it's their sort of the ways that they interact with the world that i think are quite clever in this book so they he and um his, his sort of newly found friend um, in this area are two white men. Um, they are in um, an area of South Africa that's predominantly black and the the ways that they move through the world are obviously then quite different. They are two white men who, for the most part, are treated fairly well wherever they go um, and they are because of the also because of their position as working in a hospital they also have this sort of power ingrained and this book probes a lot at these ideas of power particularly the ways that they're sort of reinforced so you know when that comes to their relationships with particularly women around them often black women there are also the ways that that interacts with with that but essentially the book i think is this really interesting character study into the tension between these two men as they sort of hold back quite a lot from each other. They're these two men who spend inordinate amounts of time together. They share a bed, well, not a bed, they share a room together. And there's a subtle homoeroticism to parts of the book around that as well that kind of pokes at this idea of this tension that, you know, quite often they'll be stood stark naked next to each other or they'll be, you know, very close to naked near each other. And there's a kind of an odd tension that sort of exists around it in this book. Um, but they're never really fully able to explore the sort of deeper sides of their friendship. They realise that they've known each other for a long time and barely speak at all. And they're constantly letting each other down or creating terrible situations with each other. But this is a very quietly powerful book, I think, in the way that Damon Galga explores... Um, the, the kinds of dynamics that allow people to exist within these worlds. Um, they can do things um, and kind of escape and get away. Um, but also it's just this really interesting character study into the kind of stillness and quietness that can exist in friendships where so much is unsaid. And I think it's a really cleverly observed novel. Um, it's, you know, maybe sometimes at, at times is a bit sort of hits you on the head a little bit with what it's sort of going for politically. Um, I think his later novels have been a bit more, a bit subtler, a, li a little bit subtler on those things. But I think this book still does a lot of really powerful things. And I can absolutely see why it was shortlisted. I mentioned there being two books on the list that I would have happily chosen as my winners. And Zoe Heller's Notes on a Scandal is my second. Um, I think this is a wonderfully written book. Um, I have a lot of love for this book. Um, and not just because it has a film with Judy Dench in it, uh, but um, Notes on a Scandal tells the story of a school teacher um, who I think is in her sort of 30s or 40s who starts having an affair with a student. Um, but at the, the sort of the behind the scenes or kind of additionally in the book, there is this very intense relationship between this woman um, this this teacher and um, an older woman who is also at the school and this relationship has this really psychosexual or kind of very very psychologically re rich and complex tone to it um, there's a sort of dependency or codependency in some ways between the two women there's a real power play constantly happening where the older woman um, seems to be sort of trying to control the younger woman and sort of using the fact that she knows this information about her um, and the, the affair with the student to kind of blackmail her or, or what have you. I think what the book also does that's really clever is just the way that it really subtly allows you to feel the, the tension seeping into your body. Um, it's an incredibly rich novel where because we're told the book often through the um through the lens of this older woman 
there's a sort of sense of otherness we're sort of watching through a window and we're getting it very much through her perspective. And her perspective is quite a cold and clipped and bitter one. And so often you get these incredible lines um, that are just brutal because th these are the observations of this woman who feels spurned by the fact that um, this woman who she wants to exercise control over maybe doesn't need her. Um, and could leave her at any time. And there's this really complicated relationship between these two women that I just think is excellently handled. Um, and I remember hearing at one point that the author, when she went to write this, um, initially just kept on going through draft after draft and something wasn't working. And she introduced this other character watching this affair and suddenly the whole book made sense because you had this observer who knew at any point that she could destroy somebody else's life but chooses not to for political reasons of sort of wanting to have this control. And it's so psychologically rich that I just think it's brilliant. I, I think this is such a... For, I, this book has a really special place in my heart. I think I also read it when I was a teenager, which sort of cemented it in my head. Um, I think it's excellent. I would have very happily seen this be the winner. Um, and I think, again, it's a book that's held... Um, I think that kind of still really works and sort of still stands to this day as well. And last but not least, we have Claire Morrell with Astonishing Splashes of Colour. Um, and this book takes its name from, uh, from I believe, Peter Pan. Yes. Um, yeah, the Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. And it references that throughout. There are re frequent references to Peter Pan, to the Lost Boys, to various other things. And at the heart of it is a woman who is incredibly sad and is really going through it and that is maybe to undersell what's happening in this very psychologically rich book um but essentially we have a woman whose whole life and existence feels to her like it's she's sort of going through the motions she has had a, a few traumatic incidents and as a result feels that she can't be a full mother um to her children and we later find out more and more about what that means in terms of her her rights around her children she's often a bit of an outcast around other people she'll say things and do things that make no sense to any other characters that seem to at first uh, there's an internal logic that we as the reader see that she says something and we kind of understand you know she's convinced that there's a there's a woman who she's convinced is pregnant and at first, having that all through her eyes, it makes sense. We think, of course, this person must be pregnant. But as this person keeps on saying, I'm absolutely not pregnant, we start to realise sort of behind the scenes that actually the character that we're reading everything through may not be that reliable. Um, she is not only not massively reliable as a narrator at times, she's not a particularly reliable narrator for, to herself for her own life. She misremembers parts of her life she can't seem to grasp what's going on around her and she's somewhat oblivious or kind of at odds with everybody else around her. And so what I think at first sort of started as a novel where I thought, oh, okay, this is quite interesting, just turned into this really deep and rich exploration of this character who in some ways is just really, really going through it. And it, it reminds me of some of the more recent books we've had um, of of sort of people going through absolute crisis. Um, it's one of those sorts of really compelling narratives um, that I just think is is so interesting. Um, yeah, it, it, it sort of reads really quite quickly as sort of a, a very accessible, very um, fast read at times. But there's something so psychologically rich going on. I keep on saying psychologically rich, but I think that's the shortlist. Um, of just these really interesting character studies um, into people's lives who don't really have much going for them at times. You know, the, the woman at the heart of this is really struggling in her life and often can't seem to pick up the pieces. You know, she's watching as everything goes on around her. She'll do the she'll she'll do horrendous things um, or say awful things or do the wrong thing and not necessarily realise or be able to stop herself. And I think I just found her so compelling as a as a character, as a reader, because you sort of just want to protect her, but you sort of know as you go through the book that things are just going to get worse and worse for her. Um, and it really, it was a really rich um, exploration of her character, I think. And, you know, putting a couple of these books side by side, like this and Brick Lane and The Good Doctor, um, 
I think, and Notes on a Scandal, I think are just such great character portraits. And this is what I think is really interesting about the judges mixing up each year, because sometimes you get these real trends of, you know, the things that some of these readers really love. And it seems like this year was really a year of character studies of, you know, even if you think about the winner of this, Fernand God Little really is exploring one central character in depth. Most of these books are really exploring one or two characters in great depth and really exploring the things that make them tick but also the things that make them act illogically um the things that make them do harmful things to themselves or to others um that make them you know make terrible decisions it's it just all these sorts of things and I, I just found them really rich um in that respect i think as a as a collection of books this is a short list that um, for, for a lot of the shortlists, I've sort of read them kind of in one block. I've kind of just really sat and focused on reading them as much as I can. This I sort of spaced it out a little bit. And it's kind of interesting because some of these I've, are just books where, as I, I hadn't necessarily thought about it until I came to compare all six books. But there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of overlap going on here. Um, and some authors who, you know, would go on to appear on the lists again. In the case of Margaret Atwood and Damon Galgut would go on to win again, or win um, from, from here, from Margaret Atwood, win again. Um, and I just think this is a really interesting shortlist in terms of what it has to say, particularly about these sort of, these uh, sort of rich inner lives of characters, um, which is something I love. I'm very drawn to that, partly also because I think once you get above two characters, I tend to forget who anyone is. I forget who, who it is when there's one character, but, you know, um, I think it's a really, really profound set of books. And like I said, I think for me, Brick Lane, um, th basically the two I don't have with me here, Brick Lane um, or... Um, uh, or Notes on a Scandal, I think are probably my two personal favourites. I think there's something so tense about the way that the inner lives of women um, are used to explore much deeper themes around um, guilt and shame and power and so many other things. Um, I just think both are excellent. Um, and yeah, I think overall, I think if it, if it wasn't one of those two, I'd probably have, um, yeah, either either astonishing splashes of colour or the good doctor as my personal winners um but yeah brick lane and um notes on a scandal are probably mine it's a weird one vernon godlittle is an odd winner and compared to the rest of this shortlist this and oryx and crake are probably the two most off topic books if that makes sense they're the ones that stand most at odds with the rest of the shortlist but there's something about the idiosyncrasy of this book um, and the way that it explores wider themes, I think, around politics, um, particularly in this case, American politics, but this this sort of growing kind of consumerist nature to do with TV, that we want to watch criminals be punished, we want to watch people suffer, if it means that it makes us feel morally good. And I think Vernon Godlittle was was very prescient in the way that it approached that. This was something, for, for 2003, this was only really... This is still quite nascent, right? Um, you know, something like Big Brother was only really just on TV. It, this this book's kind of cap, cap, really capturing a zeitgeist in that sense. So I can see why it won in that respect. I think in a longer term sense, and looking back on it 20 years after, I think something like Brick Lane is probably the natural winner for me. Um, or Notes on a Scandal, which again, I have a personal love for. But I think Brick Lane is probably the... Uh, just It's so rich and dense in terms of the way it explores... As dense is the wrong word. It's very rich in the way that it explores um, really complicated political issues and really complicated issues around sort of faith and belonging and race and identity and um, power um, all through an incredibly complicated portrait of a woman who is just really going through it. So I think overall, really interesting shortlist and I'd recommend all of the books from it. Um, but yeah, I think you can tell by now which my favourites are. I've, anyway, I've been Bob the Booker, talking about the Booker Prize as we go back over the years. Um, I hope you are doing well. Um, almost at Christmas now. Take care and speak to you all soon. Bye bye.